it's fired up. Looks like we should be live now on YouTube and Facebook. And we have more people coming into our waiting room. So for everybody who's just arriving, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Yep, we are live on Facebook. And I'll see us on Zoom here momentarily. I pick up so I can watch the chats on those as well. I do not recommend anybody else watch this in more than one location because the audio does not sync and it gets very confusing. So my recommendation would be you pick one that works well for you and you go with that. So, yep, we are live on Facebook and Zoom right now. That's great. I do not recommend anybody else watch this. And I just remember to turn down my volume on all of them. <laughs> it, it's seven o'clock. Uh, that's awesome. So let me go ahead and turn on the recording here. This program will be recorded so we can watch it later and share it. It'll be available uh, on YouTube and um, on Facebook to watch the live stream, but we'll also be working with QATV um, to provide a recording so we can have a nice uh, kind of package piece that people can enjoy afterwards and, and share with your friends. There we go. So we are recording. We are live on YouTube and Facebook and it's seven o'clock. So it's time to get started. Uh, let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen so you can see me uh, in for whatever it's worth. Uh, and now I will change this for our recording view. Good evening, everybody. I'm so glad you could join us. My name is Clayton Cheever. I'm the assistant director at the Thomas Crane Public Library in Quincy, Massachusetts. Um, as you may judge from my surroundings, I am not sitting in the library this evening, and I don't believe any of you are either. Uh, we do have people in the library um, Monday through Thursday. We are doing to-go pickup service, um, kind of like your, your your restaurant takeout. You can tell us what you like. Uh, we're, can, we can help you out with that on the phone, or you can do it through the web. Uh, and you can place your order. And then when the items come in, uh, you can uh, schedule a time to come pick them up and you can do it safely. We uh, allow up to six people every 15 minutes to come and pick up items uh, and it's contactless. So you can do that uh, right at the front door of our main library at 40 Washington Street in Quincy. Uh, we have people answering the phones. Uh, we're doing the pickup service uh, from uh, 10 o'clock in the morning is when uh, pickup service starts and the last uh, sh 15 minute block where you can schedule is at 7.45 at night. So there are definitely people in the library right now, um, but I don't think they're gonna be on this call with us. So, uh, but they are answering the phones. If you have any technical problems, you can certainly reach out to them uh, and talk to them, uh, but you can also reach out to me. I am watching the chat stream here in Zoom, uh, which is your primary means to communicate with Ken and I. Uh, if you're in Zoom with us, um, you can also chat with us on YouTube and Facebook if you'd like. I am watching both of those uh, streams as well. Uh, we're going to be taking questions at the end, but you're certainly welcome to give us questions at any time they come to you. I'll keep a running log of any questions people have uh, and share them with Ken when he's ready for them um, towards the end of the program. Several people have shared uh, images of books that you're looking forward to have Ken appraise, and he'll talk about that a bit, but I want to thank you all who did that ahead of time. It's always helpful, uh, I know, for Ken to have the ability to do some research. Um, if you have some things on, on Cameron, we have some time and there may be an opportunity if you brought something with you tonight that you're really itching. Um, so Ken will talk about that and, and ways that you can interact. Um, there's a lot happening here at the library. So I wanna tell you just about a couple of things uh, to look forward to in the future. If you're looking for other programs to interact with uh, this Thursday night. So in just two nights, we have a next in our Cooking with Colin series. It's something we've been doing actually for some time now. We've done uh, one a month with uh, my friend Colin who is a fabulous cookbook writer. He's now just written his, uh, or published his second cookbook, which is Smoothies That Taste Like Girl Scout Cookies. So if that tempts you, um, we're not gonna be talking about smoothies this week, this month uh, and this week on Thursday night. We're, he's gonna be talking about being healthy for the holidays. Um, Colin is a vegan chef uh, and, and food instructor, uh, but his food is good for everybody. So if you don't know if you're ready really to think about being healthy over the holidays, well, maybe this is the year you wanna start and you wanna go check it out. So I encourage you to come check that out. Just look at our calendar at thomasgreenlibrary.org and you'll find a link for that program. Uh, and there's lots more coming up next week. We have a debut concert happening uh, on Thursday night, the 19th. 
um, which was with uh, Duo Ami, a du piano and cello uh, a duo that came and performed a concert in the library to an audience of only Mark from Quincy Access Television and myself, uh, but we recorded it for you. I'm sorry we can't gather and share these kind of events with you in person right now. We all know the challenges we're going through, but we're doing our best and working with some awesome people to bring you the very best that we can offer uh, in the best surroundings that we can. So that's why we have Ken here tonight. Uh, I am really excited to introduce Ken Gloss from the Battle Bookshop. Hopefully you saw the interview uh, that Ken did with me talking about uh, just what we're gonna be talking about tonight. It was a lot of fun talking to him then and I know we're gonna have a ball tonight. So um, if you have any technical questions, please feel free to reach out, but I'm just gonna duck into the, the curtains now and, and let Ken take it away. Good evening, everyone. And, and thank you for joining us, Ken. Good, good evening. Thank, thank you. I'm Happy to, well, actually, I'd be happier if we were doing this at the library live, but I'm more than happy to be doing it uh, video streaming. And it's funny, you never know where people are. I had one uh, Zoom talk that I was doing and a man was watching from Cape Town, South Africa. But in any case, what I do in a talk is uh, I'll talk for about 45 minutes to an hour. The first half hour, I'll talk about what is an old book of first editions. Uh, I'll give, uh, show off a few things, give a little bit of my history and background, tell some anecdotes and stories of people I've seen, uh, things in books. Uh, and then what I like to do is the next 10 or 15 minutes, I like to do question and answer because I can go on and on and on and on about old books. And at least with question and answer, I can go on about what you want to listen to. The last couple of minutes of the talk, uh, some people did send in appraisal questions. I'll try to do a few of those. Uh, maybe in the question period here, if someone has a book and we can actually see it at the screen, we'll try. And then I'll end with a few more stories. Uh, in any case, whenever you talk about old books, the first thing that usually comes up is, what is an old book? And usually people mean by that what's a valuable old. Uh, and the first printed book was in 1456, the Gutenberg Bible. If any of you have a Gutenberg Bible, let me assure you that it's valuable. Uh, matter of fact, the last time one sold, half of it went for five and a half million dollars. Single pages sell between 50 and $100,000 on average. Now, one thing that I normally don't talk about it, uh, in my presentations, but I think this is going to be a stretch, but I'll, I'll tell you, uh, with Alex Trebek just dying, I was home about 10 years ago, and I like watching Jeopardy, and uh, this answer, and I'm going to hold this up, but this answer came up on the screen, uh, and I was an answer on Jeopardy. And I had no clue that that was going to happen. I'm sitting there watching. And next thing I see, Antiques Roadshow veteran Kenneth Gloss puts a 25 to $35 million price tag on first edition of print Bible printed by this man, obviously Gutenberg. So, hey, you never know what's going to happen. In any case, any book printed in the 1400s is valuable, some more than others, but anything in the 1400s is valuable. After that, it depends on what the book is. You can have a book printed in the 1500s that was a relatively dull and an interesting book then, and it's still a relatively dull and an interesting book now. Nobody cares or will pay very much for it. On the other hand, you can have relatively recent books. The first edition of the first Harry Potter book in London, which is only a little over 20 years old, can sell upwards of $100,000. So it all depends on what it is and how many people are looking for it. And I get loads of calls at the store and people say they have an old book and I know it's an old book. And the way I know it's old is the pages, pages are all brown and crumbling. Well, I point out that's more just lousy paper. Uh, and again, normally if I was doing this, I would be handing this around, but you'll see this isn't terribly fragile. The paper's white, the ink's black. This is, one of the first books done with illustrations. It was printed in the 1490s. So this page I'm holding is a little over 500 years old. And you say, well, gee, if they could make books like that then, why don't they do it now? 
Well, there was a big disadvantage to a book like that. First of all, in the 1490s, you had to be quite wealthy to get an education to learn how to read. You had to be almost nobility to be able to afford to buy a book like that. Nowadays, maybe the books aren't quite as well made, but they were at a price that can be distributed in the millions. And the real value of books is the knowledge in the books and the dissemination of that knowledge. And I think it's a good trade-off. Also, anytime you talk about book collecting, somebody will come up and say, I have a first edition. How much is it worth? And I point out that most first editions never came out in a second edition and probably never should have come out in a first edition. Nobody wants them, cares about them, or would pay anything whatsoever. A book has to be historically, scientifically, literarily, or for some other reason important that there are a group of collectors out there who want it. And usually when you think of first editions, you think of Dickens, Twain, Falcon, Fitzgerald, Hemingway. And even within that, there are a lot of things that can make a big difference in the price. The condition being one of the most important. The paper dust jacket on a 20th century book can make all the difference in the world. My father had a copy of William Faulkner's second book called Mosquitoes, absolutely pristine, as if someone took it from the publisher, sealed it away. At the time my father got it, he sold it within a week for $750. At the exact same time, another dealer had the same book, Mosquitoes Faulkner, first edition. It didn't have the paper jacket, had a few tiny little nicks and bumps, nothing terrible. It took them a year to sell it at $50. Because a lot of collecting is prestige. It's made up of say, being able to say, look what I have. I have the best. I have the most wonderful. Essentially, I have what you don't have. And people who can afford it will pay absolute top dollar for the very, very best, but might not consider spending anything at all for something slightly less. Other things that can affect the value, signed by the author. Well, once again, if the author is unknown, unheard of, the fact that it's signed doesn't mean that much. Maybe one of your relatives wrote a book of poetry, had 50 copies, signed it, gave it to family members. Might mean an awful lot to your family, but it doesn't add much to the price. If it's signed by someone famous, though, maybe Ernest Hemingway, that can add hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to the value. In almost any type of collecting that you get into, there are nuances that can add or subtract to the value. And I use sign books to show that off a little. There are some authors that are almost impossible to get their signature. J.D. Salinger, for instance, who wrote Catcher in the Rye. Uh, he lived in New Hampshire. He was reclusive. He didn't publish, didn't appear in public. And other than to a very close personal friend, absolutely would not sign a book. Thus, his signature adds thousands of dollars to the value because you just can't get them. Uh, now, a few asides, uh, well, one, one aside that I'll tell particularly about Salinger. One time there was a man came in and he was a friend of Salinger and he had a, a group of letters all written by Salinger. And they were good, but there was one letter that I particularly liked. Salinger had just moved into New Hampshire or he was, he had looking back when he was moving in and, he's, and was having his house built. And when they were building the foundation, they had a bunch of high school kids helping with the construction. And in this letter, Salinger was looking back and saying, well, you know, one of those kids, he was a pretty good athlete, that kid Carlton Fisk. So Carlton Fisk helped build J.D. Salinger's house. I sort of feel that that letter should be in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, but it's one of those that uh, it's still out there somewhere. I don't know. Uh, I'd love to get it, but uh, you know, not every, it's like the fish that got away. You never know, maybe you'll get it again. And one other story that I'll tell, and sometimes it's always about the people and the characters and everybody that comes in and so on. When I first started full-time at the store, which is about 40 something years ago, I hired a new employee. He had been working at the store for a week. Uh, you know, I didn't know him that well, nice guy. An older man comes into the store and he asked for an author named Donovan Yates, who's an obscure fiction writer, 
I knew who Donovan Yates was. We went up to the section. I looked, we didn't have anything. I said to him, do you want to leave your name? And he said, no, I'll check again later. He leaves. My new employee comes up to me. He goes, does that, old, that man come in here often? And I said, you know, I really wasn't paying much attention. He goes, well, that was J.D. Salinger. I used to date his daughter. So you, you never know what's going to come up. And, and again, employees can be characters. One of the most memorable introductions that I ever had was from this employee. This was a couple of weeks after the J.D. Salinger uh, introduction. Uh, he, I had four tickets to a Celtics game. And I said to him, Hugh, do you want to go to the game? And he said, sure, give me the tickets. I'll meet you there. So my wife and I show up at the game and Hugh's sitting there with a woman. And again, this is one of the most memorable introductions. He goes, I want you to meet my wife, Mickey. We're getting divorced tomorrow. What do you say to that? <laughs> anyway, you sit down and you watch the basketball game. Uh, in any case, some authors on the signatures are really hard to get. Other authors uh, maybe sign a lot of their books. There was a, a New England author that maybe many of you know, uh, I'm sure the library has books, wrote wonderful ghost, sea, fairy, treasure, pirate stories of the New England coast, Edward Rose Snow. Now, Snow was a friend of my father's and a character. And I remember one day he came into the store and he told us he had just been down on Cape Cod Snow went into a bookstore that he had never been in before, didn't know the owner. Snow went right up to the section where his books were, pulled one off the shelf, opened it up and exclaimed, my, a rare unsigned copy. Took out a pen and signed it and then went up and introduced himself to the owner of the store. So book signed by Edward Rose Snow don't add as much to the value. Uh, my father had a copy of F. Scott Fitzgerald's classic, The Great Gatsby. Now, just opposite what I was saying before, it was a first edition, but it didn't have the jacket. It was well worn and red, but when you opened it up, it was inscribed to the greatest living poet, T.S. Eliot, sincerely F. Scott Fitzgerald. Now, in addition to that inscription, when T.S. Eliot read the book, he made marginal notes, annotations, comments, crossed things out, added things into just about every page of the book. That book now would be worth two, three, maybe even $400,000 because of the association. One last story about sign books. There was an autograph and manuscript dealer in Massachusetts. He was one of the more prominent in the world. But when he was a young boy, he used to collect books by Robert Frost. And he knew Robert Frost. And when he was 13 years old, he went to London and he bought a copy of Frost's first book called A Boy's Will. Very complicated, what really is the first edition but he paid a lot of money for it. Came back to Massachusetts. A few weeks later, he met with Frost. He was very proud of himself. He said, look what I've got. And Frost looked at it and said, what did you pay for it? And he told him, Frost said, give me the book. Frost opened it up and in the front two end papers wrote a two page description on how to tell the first binding from the second binding from the third binding from the fourth, how they change bindings, why they change bindings, the different colors of the bindings, on and on and on for two pages signed it, closed the book, handed it back to the boy and said, now it's worth what you paid for it. In any case, let me digress a little, give you a little bit of my background and the history of the store. The history of the Brattle Bookshop goes back to the 1820s, but for all practical purposes, it was going out of business in 1949. My father was getting married, my mother had $500, and with that, they bought half interest in the store. And it's always been in Boston. We get calls, people are in Harvard Square, where are you? We tell them we're in downtown. Uh, when my parents first bought the store, there was a little side street called Brattle Street, which was in Scully Square. To make it more difficult, the street doesn't even exist anymore. It's where Boston City Hall Plaza is now. We've had seven different locations over the years, mainly due to urban renewal. And uh, every time my father would move, when it was a planned move, he'd move the best books to his new location, and then he'd run sales, half price, quarter dime. And the last day of the sale, everything was free. And he would literally have hundreds of people line up with bags, packs, satchels, whatever, ring a big bell, people go charging into the store, grab whatever they could grab, 
he'd ring the bell again, that group would leave, the next group would come in, and he gave away over 250,000 books that way. Now, the last time he did this was in 1969, and we were moving from the end of Washington Street to West Street, where we are now. And my father built the store on being his great love of books, his hard work, his knowledge, but he was also a bit of a character and a showman. And if you can sort of picture this, he hired a covered wagon with a cowboy and a horse team and on the cover of the covered wagon said, go West Book Lovers, go five West Street Prattle Bookshop. They filled it up with books and they drove it from the end of Washington Street near Boston City Hall, up Court Street, down Tremont by the Boston Common to where West Street is, and then back down Washington Street with my father sitting in back, throwing books out the whole way. Now, the superintendent in charge of traffic was a friend, told him he could do it all morning, but within an hour, the city was in an absolute standstill. They told him to stop. He didn't care. He got on his point across, and we've been on West Street since then. When we first moved in, we were in a 150-year-old five-story wooden building crammed full of books. In February of 1980, I got a call at four o'clock in the morning. The building was on fire. Uh, they Literally, it burnt to the ground. I mean, it was 100% gone. We had basically no insurance, but the main thing was to keep going, to continue. We found a storefront a few doors up the street. We rented folding tables. People either sold, gave us, donated books. Kevin White, who was the mayor at the time, came down with a carload of books. And we, we opened again within a month. The main thing was just keep going. It was a meager stock. Over the next four years, we slowly but surely rebuilt the stock. Four years after that, we bought the building we're in now, which is, again, a few doors down on West Street. It's sort of the old Dickensian type of store. Outside stands at a dollar, three and five, two floors of general use books, and then a third floor with rare books, autographs, manuscripts, leather bindings, and so on. And that type of business, the large old general secondhand store, particularly in the inner city, is a dying business. And it's not dying because people don't like books, buy books, sell books, read books, but particularly in the last number of years uh, in the inner cities, property value has gone so high, that rent has gone so high, that old bookstores, which I assure you are not the most efficiently run businesses in the world, one right after the other have gone out of business. And in the last 20 years or so, the internet has just speeded that process along. And needless to say, the last seven or eight months with the pandemic has even, uh, even pushed a lot of them out again. We're absolutely determined that we're gonna keep going and hopefully we will. And uh, so, you know, that's, that we definitely are gonna do. Um, and one of the things that uh, comes up that uh, with it though, is that uh, we, one of the more interesting parts about uh, the business for me is going out to houses and states. And I'll get to that a little, but one of the things I wanted to show off, if, if there was one thing that I wish I could find, I'll, I'll do a little show and tell. There's a little pamphlet here called Tamerlane by a Bostonian. It was done in 1827. It doesn't look like very much, but the Bostonian who did this was Edgar Allan Poe. It's, a, it's his first book. It's a classic rarity in American literature. Matter of fact, the first copy to ever show up was in the Cornhill area of Boston in the 1890s. A dealer had it on his 10 cent table. Another dealer spotted it there, bought a stack of books so it wouldn't stand out. And in 1890, sold it for $1,000. Then in the 1950s, there were two postmen in the New Bedford area who on the side were book scouts and being uh, postmen, they knew where all the yard sales were. They bought a trunk, went to a yard sale, bought a trunk of books, bought them in the trunk as a Tamerlane. Families got involved. They got to negotiating. And uh, after six months, they sold it for $10,000. Now, I don't know if it was worth it because they started out best of friends. By the time they sold it, they never spoke again, but they got their $10,000. And then about 20 years ago, an antique dealer died in the Newburyport area. His whole estate was auctioned, paintings, prints, furniture, antiques, books as a group, $600 to an antique dealer in New Hampshire. They took all the pamphlets, put them in a box, $15 each. Someone, of course, picked out a Tamerlane. 
20 years ago sold it for $198,000. One sold a few years ago for $800,000. And I'll say, unfortunately, this is a facsimile. Uh, I don't sort of handle million dollar pamphlets like this, but if any of you have taken a, a close look and then go and check your attic sellers, basements, whatever, if you find one, please give me a call. A lot of the fun of collecting is studying, is learning about something, is appreciating it. It's really your knowledge that makes something interesting and thus valuable. Someone might look at something and say, oh, that's a scrap of paper. Someone else might say that's a broadside that led to the Boston Tea Party, that led to the American Revolution, that led to our country's independence. So it's really that knowledge and understanding that makes something interesting and thus valuable. Now, the item I have here next, I think is interesting on the surface, but the story behind it may be even more so. This is on White House stationery. It's dated April 11th, 1933, and it starts, Dear Jim, I want to send you this note to tell you how happy I am that you are to represent the United States in Poland. It's a most important post, et cetera, et cetera, signed always sincerely Franklin Roosevelt, and it's to the Honorable James Michael Curley, Mayor of Boston. Now on the surface, this seems like a great honor. It's an ambassadorial appointment. Well, Curley didn't think it was such an honor. I, matter of fact, I think he thought Roosevelt was trying to get rid of him, which of course he probably was. And Curley's response to Roosevelt was, remember this was in 1933, Curley said, in Poland, with Germany on one side, Russia on the other, you should send your worst Republican enemy to Poland. He said, matter of fact, if you think it's so important, why don't you quit and go there yourself? Now, Curley's oppression of uh, Washington didn't change over the years. We also have about 10 letters he wrote to his wife when he was in Danbury prison. Now, even though these were personal letters, he was still very much the politician. And there was one quote I particularly liked. He had just gotten into prison and he wrote to his wife and he said, many of the four-legged creatures in my cell have more honor than the two-legged creatures in Washington. In any case, enough for Curley. Other things we have, uh, pamphlets, brochures. Here's a program from the 1912 World Series. The Red Sox won the World Series in 1912, won a few more times in the teens, and then we had to wait a long, long time. Uh, we've won it four times again. I don't, we don't have to wait as long again. But not only is this interesting as a baseball item, but on the back, there's an ad for arrow shirts and collars. Collars are two for a quarter, shirts are a dollar and a half and two dollars. I don't think you'll get them for that now. Also, it's become very popular to go on cruises, cruise ships, I have a brochure here for a ship, tells you how wonderfully built, where to book passage, and anyone who wants to go on the Titanic, this is an original brochure for it. And you know, almost anything you can think of, there are people out there who are interested. There are whole societies of Titanic historians who do nothing but study the Titanic. There's also a tendency that whenever you talk about books and, or collectibles or of any type, that all of a sudden everything seems to be worth thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. And I like to point out, not everything has to be high priced to be fun. Here's a Life magazine with Errol Flynn on the cover. Another with Elizabeth Taylor when she was 15 years old. The large, large majority of these sell for a few dollars. There are, there are a few that go a little bit higher, but they're a lot of fun. We used to have, by a wall and a stairway at the store, a few hundred of these Life magazines hanging on the wall. People would stop and stare at that wall, sometimes for a half an hour, an hour at a time, lost in thought and memory. They loved them for the stories, the articles, the photographs. They made wonderful birthday or anniversary presents if you fell on the right date. But there was uh, one day a regular customer of ours came in and he bought about 50 Life magazines from World War II. It wasn't what he normally bought. So I said to him, why are you buying these? And he said, well, I wanna teach my children about World War II 
And he thought an interesting way to do it would be to get some of the old life magazines, look at a few of the photos, read a couple of the articles, and then discuss it with them. Sounded like a great idea to me, but I was a little skeptical. Came in a few weeks later and I said to him, how's it going with the lights? He said, fabulously, but not the way I thought. He says, the kids don't care about the stories, the articles, the photographs, but they love the ads. And he says, and it turns out by looking at and discussing the ads with them, he could probably teach them more about what the United States was like during World War II than if they had read and looked at everything else. I have other things here. I have a cookbook from the 1700s. Some of the recipes are wonderful. And then you have how to bake eels the common way. And I don't know if I want to bake them anyway, but that's beside the point. One of the most interesting parts about the business for me is going out to houses and estates. That's how we get most of our books. It's almost like being Jim Hawkins on Treasure Island every day, never knowing who you're gonna meet, the people, the places, the characters. And I'll relate a few of those stories to you. And then after that, maybe uh, we'll see about some uh, questions. Now, let me also say, I, I tell a lot of stories in this. Uh, I have pages and pages of stories but I do do a podcast called Brattlecast. So if any of you like these stories, Brattlecast is about 20 minutes. There are about 80 of them out now. Every two weeks is another one. Either get it through Apple off our website and say you like it, please. Uh, in any case, uh, I was out of the store. Uh, I got back, there was a message that a Mrs. Fisher had called. She had some books. I called her up and she said, oh yes, my father died in Providence. He has about 500 art reference books. We want to get the best price we can. We're asking a number of dealers down to bid on them. Would you be interested? Well, 500 art reference books sounded like a good library. Providence is only an hour away. We go much further than that regularly. Um, so I was happy to go. They lived in an old street called Benefit Street up near Brown University. Got to the house. It was a large old colonial house. Got led through the house into a courtyard, into a garage. Second floor of the garage, there were 5,000 books. Well, it turned out her, her married name was Fisher. Her father's name was John Nicholas Brown. Family founded Brown University, one of the wealthier families in the country. And after about six months, I bought about 80% of the books I wanted. I was pleased, she seemed happy. And she said, my mother has a lot of books. Uh, would you like to go to Newport to take a look at them? So, some, so most are being given to the uh, university, some are being sold at auction, but if you wanna to go to Newport, well, you can take a look. Well, their house in Newport is one of the mansions on the ocean. I mentioned this to my wife. She decided to come with me on this deal. And one of the fascinating parts about it was being in one of those mansions that was still being lived in by a family. And at one point wandering from the basement to the attic, all on my own without a tour guide saying, come here, go here, don't touch this, do that, but just wandering through the, it was fascinating. <clears throat> Another time I got called to Newport to do an appraisal. Now, when I do appraisals for groups like this or at the store or online, uh, I do hundreds of free appraisals. Matter of fact, my goal is that whenever you think of an old book, you think of me in the Brattle Bookshop. I don't care if you think of 10 others, but uh, one of the ways though I feel I can do that is by giving out as much free information as reasonably possible. But there are times people need formal written appraisals for insurance, estate taxes, then I discuss a fee. Any case, another mansion in Newport, not quite as big as the Browns. This was the Perry family, Commodore Perry, Oliver Hazard Perry. And what they had was a whole stack of papers from the War of 1812. During the war, their family were privateers. Well, they're privateers if you're on our side. They're pirates if you're on the other side. It's all the way you look at it, but it was a day-to-day -day accounting to the ships. And they were fascinating to read through. They would sometimes capture a ship and realize tens of thousands of dollars profit. In 1812, that was an incredible amount of money. Then one day, one of the ships got into a battle. The ship got hit. The captain got hit. He lost his leg. Three days later, there was a tiny entry at the bottom of a page that said, Captain, $5 bonus, loss of leg. And that was the last year of the captain. So, you know, that's a little different nowadays too. When my father was still alive and he died in over 35 years ago, 
we got a call from a lady. She was very vague about her name, who she was, what she had, but it sounded like she had a few good things. She lived close by in Sharon. We decided to go out. We got to the house. It was a little ranch house. Paint was peeling, weeds were growing. And you sort of say, oh, gee, what's gonna be here? She answered the door. She was elderly. We walk in. There were just gorgeous antiques everywhere. I mean, really, really beautiful antiques. And she gets to talking. It turned out she was originally from the Boston area, but she had married the prince of the Ukraine, the cousin of the Tsar of Russia. He had escaped just before the revolution. And she told story after story about being Russian nobility in Europe and all the court intrigues and all the goings on, how T.E. Shaw used to stay at her house all the time, how she didn't think he accidentally died on a motorcycle, but there was a lot more to it. T.E. Shaw, of course, was Lawrence of Arabia. And she went on and on and on with these wonderful stories. Turned out her books were lousy, but the stories were absolutely wonderful. And when we first got into the house on a wall, she had 10 watercolors. They were pastoral European scenes. But when I first saw them, I thought they were nice. And the more she talked and the longer we were there and the more I looked at them, the nicer I thought they were. And I finally said to her, those 10 watercolors, they're really nice. And she sort of turned around and said, oh yes, they're all Turners. So she had 10 original Turner watercolors, probably a million dollars worth of painting. It was just like, oh yes, they're all, you, so you never know who you're gonna see, the people, the places, characters. And matter of fact, speaking of characters, uh, a number of years ago, we went to a customer's 100th birthday parties. Now, when you go to a man's 100th birthday party and he tells you he just got back from Barcelona, he's going to give a talk in Florida and he's been asked to talk in Tokyo. And I finally said to him, wait a minute, you're 100 years old. Don't you think Tokyo is an awfully long way to go? And he said, well, when I used to work, it took me well over 25 hours to get to Chicago. He says, I don't think Tokyo is a whole lot further than that nowadays. And here's a man who could one day can tell you about sitting down to dinner with Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. Now, he was obviously a much younger man at the time. He said he was looking forward to this dinner and all the learning and insight he was going to get from these two men. And uh, he said he was excited about it. He got to the table a little bit early. He said five minutes later, Ford came in and sat down next to him. And about 15 minutes later, Edison came in. Now, Edison was elderly, had one of those big horns for hearing, sat down opposite. And he said the first thing, Ford turned to Edison and yelled, my Tom, you look very good. And Edison turned to Ford and yelled, it's the Cotter's little liver pills. <clears throat> this man said all night long, all they did was yell about Cotter's little liver pills. And he said, next time he wanted to learn something, he went to the library. I can go on and on and on with these stories. I'll tell one more for now, and then maybe we'll see about some questions. We get hundreds of phone calls at the store, people wanting to know, do you have a book? Can you get a book? How hard is it to get the book? Does the book exist? Or what's the value? How much is it worth? And so on. Most of those questions, either I or the people I work with, we can answer right off the top of our heads. Some are a little more involved and occasionally you really have to do some research. But every once in a while you get a call that really stands out. <clears throat> and again, this was a while ago, but I answered the phone, hello, Brattle Bookshop. Can I help you? Lady, elderly, very thick Irish brogue. And the first thing she says is, President Kennedy slept with me. You have to admit that gets your attention. She waited a while for it to sink in. And then she went on to explain that she had worked for the Kennedy family. And when, uh, when he was three and four years old, she was his nursemaid and he used to fall asleep in her arms. So he did sleep with her but maybe not what you first think. And what she had was a whole series of handwritten letters from the president. Now, presidential letters of any type have value. Handwritten letters from later 20th century presidents are particularly hard to get, high priced and valuable. She wanted to get an offer. I was act actually skeptical about that, but I thought she'd be fun to meet. I went to her house. She was great, wonderful stories. The letters were fabulous. I gave her what I thought was a tremendous offer much as I suspected, though, there was no way she could sell these letters. They were part of her life. 
I left a note behind. As far as I know, her family still has them, probably where they belong. Who knows? Maybe someday I'll hear about them again. And like I say, why don't I see if there are some questions? And quite honestly, anything anyone asks me, I can go off on a tangent. Uh, Clayton, is there anyone or any things that have come up? Uh, so I would encourage anybody, I'm watching the, the streams. Nobody has sent me any questions yet this evening. Okay. Um, but I know that people had some things. That, so I don't know if you want to talk about anything people shared. I'll, I'll, I'll tell or... you what then. Uh, if there aren't any, I'll tell a few more of the stories. Uh, a few people sent in things that they wanted to praise. I'll tell a few of those. Uh, people sometimes ask me, uh, you know, what's some of the most interesting and valuable things that you've ever seen? And I will mention, I'll mention a few of the things that, that, have, uh, that I've seen and handled, and then I'll give a little bit different take on the, uh, I'll ask myself the question, and then I'll give a little take. Um, I, one of the more interesting things, or a few of the interesting things are things that I've had to appraise for libraries, universities, for insurance purposes. I recently got called by a museum, a local museum, they were loaning uh, something to another museum and they just needed an appraisal for the insurance. They told me what it was and I said, well, I, I like your museum. I'll uh, be happy to do the appraisal. I'll do it for free, but I don't wanna do it from your website, from a copy. I wanna I want to be able to see and hold the item. It was a four page handwritten account of Paul Revere's ride by Paul Revere. So I'm sitting there holding Paul Revere's handwritten account of his ride. And, you know, I deal with this type of material. And it's still, every time you touch something like that, it sends a chill up your spine. Paul Revere sat with this piece of paper, wrote down his idea, or Thomas Jefferson, or Abraham Lincoln, or, uh, you know, it, it still sends a chill up your, your spine. Another time, I got a call uh, to go out to Drake, it, which is near Lowell. I uh, got to the house, you know, nothing was really said about what the person had. It was a nondescript World War II type ranch house. Go in, <clears throat> it had all the original furniture, four Michael tables and all that. And they had a few interesting books I was looking around, but on the kitchen table, there was this big, huge roll of paper, sort of like a teletype roll, a big, huge roll. Turned out it was the original manuscript for On the Road. The literally, the manuscript uh, that Kerouac wrote on the road. I got to pick it up, touch it. I unrolled it a foot or two, but it was too fragile to do that. Turned out the person who called me was his nephew. So I got to pick up and hold the original manuscript for on the road. Now, a few years later, they sold it at auction for two and a half million dollars, but got to see it. An another time, uh, I got called into uh, another university. Uh, I was a chemistry major, so I majored in science in college and all of that. They had a first edition of Isaac Newton's book, Principia Mathematica, which is one of the most famous books in mathematics, science, calculus. And a first edition of that is close to a million dollars. And I got to touch it and hold it. But what was so special about this copy it was Isaac Newton's copy that he had written notes in the margin. I mean, in the in, actually one of the more interesting parts about that, I got to hold it and touch it. It went from the university that it was at, which was Babson and Wellesley. Then it went to MIT. And then from MIT, it went out to the Huntington Library in California. And recently I was in California for an antiques roadshow, book, book show and so on. We went, my wife and I, we went to the Huntington Library, went to the glass case where that first edition is now, and I was going to myself, I actually touched that. But one last thing that I'll say about what I think is the most valuable book I, that I can think of, I was recently listening to a colleague of mine giving a talk on that, and the same question came up. What's the most valuable thing? Now, he was head of an auction gallery. It, had items that had run in the millions of dollars. And he said, thought a second, and he said, the books that I read to my sons when they were little kids, that's the most valuable books. And that immediately made me think, every Christmas Eve, 
from the time my daughter was barely could sit up, I read the night before Christmas to my, well, both my daughters, but my older one in particular uh, fell in love. And we always did it from the same edition with the same illustrations year after year after year. She's now in her mid thirties. I still have to read from that edition to her the night before Christmas, every Christmas Eve. And it even got to the point where once her husband's from Texas and they were down visiting his family. Uh, so she made me do it on YouTube so she could tune in on Christmas Eve and have me reading it to her. So I have to admit that probably, when I really think about it, is probably one of the most valuable books I've ever had, held and still have. And again, I could go on and on and on with that, but- uh, well, We have a couple of folks, Ken. Uh, so okay. we, have a, we have a shout out, Muffy Lutzvin, or Lutzin, uh, says hello and wanted to, I assume okay. she's a friend of yours, so just wanted yes. to say hi. Um, another person said they have some books that are from the 1870s, one is poems by Bret Hart, H-A-R-T-E, and wondering if you've ever heard of Bret. Oh, a... yes. Bret Hart was a very popular, uh, best-selling poet, author of the time, 1870s. He was a good friend of Mark Twain and all that. Now, one of his most famous books probably would not be politically correct now. It was called The Heathen Chinese, uh, which, of course, with all the Chinese coming, uh, immigrating into the uh, United States, especially to build the railroads out west and so on. But he wrote books, but he was a very popular sort of Western poet, author, uh, novelist. Uh, most of his things nowadays are not particularly valuable. Just for the, the, when you started off that question, do you know who he is? Well, yes, I do know who he is because I do this as a living. Most people have, if you went out on the street and said, oh, have you read Bret Hart recently? They'd have no clue whatsoever that you're talking about. Um, so I would have to see exactly which ones they had. A few of them will run into the low hundreds. Something maybe could be slightly higher. The large majority though, nobody knows who he is anymore. So unless he makes a big comeback, uh, they're not terribly valuable. But they're still a fun part of American literary history. So uh, there's a general question wondering what is the best way to have individual books evaluated? Uh, is it best just to email photos like some people did ahead of time on a description or are there better ways to, to get your services? Well, let me put it this way. If I was really doing this talk the way I really wanted to do it, I would be at the Crane Library. We'd have people sitting around. Uh, maybe, you know, the audience wouldn't be as big on YouTube, but maybe you could do that too and stream it. But uh, it's always best to see it in person live and be able to touch it, handle it, look for everything that is necessary. But nowadays, what, what I tell people is usually pictures and email is perfectly good. People tell me, one of the things that happens on an individual book, and we had a few sent in, and actually most of them, and I'll apologize to the people who sent in, I definitely am not gonna be able to get to them all uh, in this uh, format, but I will answer everybody. Uh, but there was someone who sent in a thing called Yagi's Geographical Portfolio from 1983. It had 14 chromolithographs. And one of the things that the pictures they sent, they're beautiful maps and pictures. Uh, and it's a book that can sell for a few thousand dollars or more. But from the picture, it looked to me like there might be a little bit of damage to it. So that's one of the great things that sending images tell people. Another thing that people call me, they have a library they've inherited or they're moving and they have a large collection of books. And usually our first questions is how many books do you have, um, you know, any particular type? And the very common answers is we have a lot in their fiction and nonfiction. The problem is a lot doesn't tell us much and every book is either fiction or nonfiction. But, you know, we try to say to people, well, look, um, you know, is there any particular subject areas uh, about how many? But if you take a picture of bookshelves and sometimes you can take one, two shelves at a time, if we can read the spines, 
we can get a really good idea of what you have, what the values are, or what we can do is most of them aren't valuable, but the second book down and the third book over, we need to see that more carefully. So that is much better for us than even a list. Now, uh, other things that will come up is there's huge amounts of information online about used books. There are sites like ABE Books, Amazon Books, which by the way owns ABE and others, and people look things up on these lines, on these websites. Problem is they're unedited. So anyone can put anything up at any, and whether it's accurate, not accurate, uh, there are computer algorithms. So people sometimes go on and they say, wait a minute, this book at a dollar sounds exactly like what I have. And this book at a thousand dollars sounds exactly like what I have. What's going on? Well, the truth is they might be exactly the same. And it's just two people don't know, you know, one thinks it's worth this, one thinks it's worth that. But what I tell people is if you go online, it's like any other tool. If you know how to use it, it's great. If you don't, well, it can be helpful. Uh, and matter of fact, the first thing I tell people when you go online and look is the, don't look at the price, look at how many. If there are 50, 100, 200 copies online and available, that tells you immediately there are 50, 100 or 200 copies that whatever prices they are, they're not selling. And you don't go also, well, the highest price is this, the lowest price is that, probably about halfway is right. Because if you're going to buy it, you're not going to say, well, gee, it's $100, it's a dollar, I'll pay 50. You're going to go, gee, if the dollar book is just as good, I'll buy that one. So it brings everything down to the lowest common denominator. But the other thing you can do is call someone like me. Uh, I can look at your bookshelves, I can look at lists, and I can pretty much tell you from my experience of years and years of doing this. And, and, and I totally understand where somebody might say, well, wait a minute. Can we trust what you're saying? Because if you want to buy it, you know, and, and that, you know, and that's a perfectly legitimate question. But what I can at least do is I can go through that list or look at those pictures and say, look, this one, this one, and this one are the ones you want to spend your time on. I think they're worth this, this, and this. And if you want to check that, go to this site, go to that site, and go to this site. And I can save you a lot of time in effort. And one of the other things about if you're looking to collect books, if you're looking for information, if you're not sure about what price range, if you're not sure whether it's a first edition, how can I tell? And if you have these questions, someone like myself, who I love what I do, I enjoy what I do, maybe from just the way I'm presenting this, you can tell. If you ask somebody a question who loves what they do, the problem isn't getting an answer it's getting them to stop answering. So, you know, ask for help. There's nothing wrong with that. Go online, check, but there's no one simple sentence answer because there are billions and billions and billions of books that have come out even before printing to every day. And every one of them has that little nuance that is, can make the difference between a few dollars and sometimes tens of thousands or millions of dollars. So, so Ken, I'm going to take your 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 comment just a, a, a couple of you know 15 seconds ago as an invitation. We have uh, a general question about the bookstore, and then a couple of examples. And I'm sure there could be great ranges as you were just explaining. Sure. So, I'll ask a general question. It came through first. Um, the person says that their fiance complains that books from the Judaica section at your bookstore seem to really fly off the shelves. They see a book and come back for it a little bit later. It's always seems to be gone when they whenever they get back. And they're wondering if there are certain sections of the bookstore that you've noticed that books really sell a lot faster, have a much higher turnover than other sections. And, and tell us a little bit about what are the hotspots. I'm sure it's changed over the years. Well, it's changed. Yeah, there are sections that, that, that definitely sell better than other sections. Uh, Judaica is one area. Well, it's interesting. If you get very scholarly books in almost any subject, the really scholarly, really good ones, the ones that go into details, almost any subject, those are the ones that sell well. If you also look at our Judaica sections and you have the sort of general book about Israel, a sort of coffee table, travel log, 
those can sit on the shelf for years and years and years. And, uh, and, and the other thing about a used bookstore is a used bookstore by the nature of the store can fill up with the books that don't sell. I mean, if you think about it, let's say I go out and buy a library of mathematics books and there's eight shelves, two shelves sell, you know, just like this person was saying, you walk in, those two shelves fly off the shelf. Hopefully you make a good part of your money back. Then there are two more shelves that over the next few months, they still sell steadily and so on. And you make, you know, your profit on that. Then you've got two shelves that, uh, you know, a book here or there. And then you've got two more that probably they're never going to sell. Well, you go out and buy another mathematics library, the same thing happens. The next thing, instead of two or four shelves that aren't selling, you have four or eight shelves that aren't selling. And if you know our store, we have outside stands at a dollar and three and five. That's where a lot of those books come from, the things that have been sitting on the shelves. Otherwise, I, I look at the outside books, the two ways I look at it. People love the bargain books and so on. I look at them almost as a monster that you have to keep feeding and you shovel, keep shoveling books out into this monster and people keep grabbing them. But also, I also look at them as the store's pressure valve. If we didn't have that outside section, the store would explode because all the books would build up too much pressure. But one of the good things about a used and general bookstore is you could walk into the store and let's say you collected books on the War of 1812. You could walk in one day and look at our section and there won't be one book on the War of 1812. And you could say, gee, that's, they're really not that good of books so they don't have anything. Two weeks later, we could go to somebody's estate, buy 500 books on the War of 1812. If you walk in the next day after that, you could go, they're the greatest bookstore in the world. But then you look at it from my point of view, my gut feeling would be to say my ideal bookstore would never have a book in it. I would go out to an estate, I'd buy the books, I'd put them out in the morning, by an hour later, every one of those books would have sold and I'd have no books. And that would happen day after day after day. But you know, also that wouldn't be fun and, and so on, but it's different ways of looking at it. But yeah, good, the specific question is, the really good books in almost any subject sell very quickly and uh, and the nice part about it, and the reason we have regular customers who come in every day, we literally have one customer who calls in sick when he's not coming in. He's, a, he's afraid we'll put a book out on the shelf that day and somebody else will buy it before he can get to it. So he calls us to say that he's sick and he can't make it in. Uh, one anecdote that I'll say, uh, a customer, a regular customer came in, we got a big collection of cookbooks in. And it was a really good collection, a thousand cookbooks, old ones. So, but they had two boxes worth of these little pamphlets, you know, how to make jello. They're very decorative, baker chocolates, but you know, they're good, but they take a lot of time. And, and this was a great collection. I said to the person working with it, I said, look, just put the two boxes outside on the dollar table. There were some bargains in there, but it takes too much time. A couple of hours after we put this in, a customer comes running in with this one pamphlet. And he goes, I've been looking for this for years and years and years. And he goes, and, and it's a dollar. And, and he was just so beside himself, so excited. And I look at it and the title is Coconuts and Constipation. So you never know. Any case, what's the next question? I can, like I said, I can go off and tangent. <laughs> That's great. Um, so we've got three specific titles that people are asking about. Sure. Um, the first one uh, is copyright 1929. Uh, it's by Reginald C. Barker, uh, and it's the Hair Trigger brand. They say it has a dust jacket, but the spine is broken. Uh, it's uh, quite honestly a book I don't know. The Hair Trigger brand. Uh, I it might be a Western of some type, uh, but uh, with the spine broken and so on, chances are it's it's nothing that regularly gets asked for. With the broken spine, probably not. But if they want to get in touch with me, either email or call, I'll, I'll find out exactly. But it's very unlikely. What's the next one? Okay, the next one is uh, the house that Jack built. 
Uh, it's an R. Caldecott picture book published in London by Frederick Warren and Company. Uh, uh, that's all the details I shared. Yeah, it, it's it's a good book. Uh, Caldecott books are sought for their late 1800s. Is that a, related to the Caldecott Award? Or yeah, the, I mean, yeah, that's where the Caldecott, uh, he, he was an illustrator and the Caldecott Awards is for illustrators. It's honoring him, okay. So that's where that comes from and people do collect Caldecott books. Uh, there are many, many reprints. If they're the reprints, it's, you know, it's five, ten dollars If it turns out it is the first edition and in very good shape, they can anywhere from 25 to a few hundred dollars. In the two types of books that are usually in worst condition consistently are cookbooks because of the way they're used and children's books by who uses them. So getting children's books in really fine shape can be tough because if children use them, which is what they're intended for, they can be tricky. What's the last one? So the last one is, it sounds like a collection of books by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, uh, copyright 1859. Um, and it looks like author edition is what they've said. So I'm not sure what author edition, that's not a, a term that I'm familiar with. Well, author, what, what a lot of um, publishers would do with famous authors 1859, even for Elizabeth Barrett Browning, is a little bit late. She's very popular. People collect her books. Her first editions go for a lot of money. But a lot of times when they uh, publishers put out sets, they would name them. They'd call them the deluxe edition, the author's edition, the poet's edition, the this edition. Sometimes they'd be limited editions, and people were selling them door to door. And when they sold out one edition, they'd just rename it, and they'd sell another limited edition. Uh, usually with the Elizabeth Barrett Browning, a lot of those are in very, very beautiful leather bindings that have to be in perfect shape. If they're gorgeous leather and in perfect shape, they'll probably sell into the low hundreds. But if there's one chip on one binding, they lose that decorative value. And uh, they, they're just great books to read, but not particularly valuable. Uh, I'll tell you what, I noticed we're getting sort of towards the hour. Is there another question or two that I- That's all we've had so far. Okay. So certainly if people have any extras, I wonder, you know, I, I assume I, I collect um, ARCs, you know, whenever I go to a conference, advanced reader copies. And they always, you know, I feel bad. I don't want to actually ever have those end up because I feel like it's, it isn't genuine. It's, it's a draft of the book. Do those ever come across and do those have value sometimes? I, I feel like it's disrespectful to the authors to circulate them, but perhaps there's a market. It's actually very interesting uh, about that. I'll end with that and then I'll tell one more story to end the talk. Uh, advanced reader copies, usually a copy sent out either to review people so that they can get it early before the publisher puts it in the stores so that they can write a review in a magazine, on TV, radio, whatever, on YouTube. Um, uh, and they put them out and they usually say not for sale um, and, and they send out a fair number of them. 99.9% .9 of them aren't valuable. Uh, the collectors usually want the actual first published edition read it. And unless it's a very, very famous author and there's something about the reader's edition that changes, generally they don't. But an interesting thing, we, ha we have uh, one person who's a review book, does a lot of book reviewing. And it's always sort of been the bane of a publisher that they'd have to send out these, what they call review copies, because a lot of reviewers, the way they make a little extra money, not just doing and writing the review, but then they'd have two or three or five boxes full of relatively new books. They'd go to a used bookstore, sell them. Well, of course, the publisher didn't like that because then whoever bought them at the used bookstore was buying them at half price and not buying a copy at full price as new. The way they've gotten around that in, is now almost all those review copies are digital. They, uh, there are still some hard covers they send out, but almost everything now in advanced copies and that are going out digitally, which of course then you can't sell. So the publishers have gotten around that through technology to a degree. Uh, I'll tell you, like I say, there are some people who wrote in and emailed. Uh, I'm not gonna have a chance to get to all of this, but I will either if you call the store or I'll email back to you and I'll do the appraisals. And if there's anyone who's out there listening to this and wants appraisals, you know, either email, call me or whatever, and I'll be happy to do them for you. 
one last story that I'll end with. And first of all, a couple of things. If you like the stories, Brattlecast, the podcast, every two weeks, a new one comes out, they're 20 minutes. Also, please watch the Antiques Roadshow. I've been doing it for 20 years. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I could go on talking about how that show's all done and, and the fun of it. It's a great way to see the country. Uh, my wife and I go out and we've been all over. I mean, why would I ever go to Fago or Bismarck or, or many of the, in any place you go in this country, if you make any effort at all, it's absolutely beautiful. The people are absolutely one of, wonderful. Don't talk about politics or religion if you're smart, but it, it's great to do it. But last, last little story to end with. I got called to do an appraisal at a large old church in Boston. The church is well over a hundred years old. Uh, they had, had a large library and over the years they had just accumulated a lot of books and they wanted me in there to just see, you know, was anything valuable? I spent a day at the church and actually they had some really good books. It was a lot of fun. At the end of the day, the priest said to me, could you come down the basement? There were a few more books. Went down the basement, looked a few more books. And then in the corner, there was what was a closet or actually more like a small room. And the priest opened the door front to back, floor to ceiling, top to bottom. It was stuffed with thousands of old Bibles. And I looked at the priest and I said, you know, what is this? And he said, well, people hate to throw away a book. They feel it's sacrilegious to throw away a Bible. So what happens when a parishioner dies and the family doesn't want the Bible? They come and they present it to the church. And what do we do? We, ver we don't want to offend anybody. We very graciously accept it. Then we go downstairs, open the door, put it in with the rest of them. He says, when well, we can't drive a dumpster up to the back of the church and fill it full of Bibles, that would just be horrible. So I use it as an example to say that if you want to give something to a charity, ask them if they want it first. If they want it and can use it, uh, don't, you know, uh, it's all good for everybody. And I will say, I will end with one last thing too. Um, did I just, <laughs> I think I just cut myself off. No, you're still with us, Ken. Oh, I'm, we're still yeah. with, okay. Yeah, no problem, you're still there. Uh, in any case, uh, if any of you ever have any questions, don't ever feel you're bothering us. We never want to hear that somebody says, I just threw away a Tamerlane. Call, ask, email. You were more than happy to talk about it and come into the store. And thank you very much for sitting and listening. And I only hope that maybe relatively soon we can all get together and do this live in person. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ken. It's such a pleasure to have you join us tonight. I, I, you know, it's a, it's a private chat, so you haven't been able to see, but there's been several people who have expressed their appreciation for their time, uh, for your time tonight. And I know, um, you know, I, I actually, before I even knew I would ever work in a library, I worked in a used bookstore in Colorado and it was a cooperative and I, I totally, you know, share the, the love and appreciation for the find, for the hunt, for finding these great treasures. And I also just love seeing the book that speaks to me, you know, the book that you can share that that makes it such a, you know, it's a, in my life, it's always been the perfect gift um, to be able to, you know, just connect with a child who on a birthday or with a friend who is like, you know, just, I, I, I saw this and I thought of you. It's just, they, they speak so many, so much. So I know that your work is really appreciated and, and so many great stories. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. It's been a real pleasure to have you join us. Um, the friends of the library, I should always put a plug, they do run the bookstore at the library, um, which you probably have come and visit. I know we have dealers sometimes who come and, and browse the books get donated there and, and they, people have had some real finds there. Friends haven't been able to operate the bookstore since we closed the library in March. Um, so, I, and I know we're not even, we haven't been accepting donations all that time because one of the means to process them. So I'm just glad, I, I love to see books find a good home. There's there was a librarian who said, you know, one of the, the greatest gifts in life as a librarian is to know that every book has its reader and every reader can find their book. And it's that art of ma matching those two together that I always love. So, yeah. Ken, I'm so grateful that you're helping people find books that speak to them. That's really great, thank you. Thank you very much. And the other thing that I'll add to that is most people who are interested in books are interesting people, and that can be a lot of fun. I'll sign off now. Thank you. Come into the store, call, email, whatever. 
it's fun. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Have a great night. Bye-bye.